Okay, so we're about to start for the second half of um, t today's meeting and we are extremely lucky and I have to say when I um, contacted uh, Colin Cartwright initially and asked if she'd uh, be prepared to be our speaker, I sort of didn't really expect that she'd say yes and I was absolutely delighted that she was um, willing to come. And uh, Co Professor Colin Cartwright was previously the Foundation Professor of Aged Services and the Director of Aid Services Unit at the Southern Cross University. She's been a member of the Australian Association of Gerontology for more than 20 years, and she has extensive teaching and research experience in ageing, ethics, and medical decisions at the end of life. She has researched at both national and international levels. She's published articles in major journals and has authored several book chapters. And Professor Cartwright also was, uh, was the person who designed our advanced healthcare directives. Can I see a show of hands if you have an advanced healthcare directive? Well, this is, this is really good. If you, if you haven't, um, you can get them from us. Um, either you can download them on, uh, from online for free or you can buy them from, from Gab uh, directly. And then, yes, <laughs> exactly. And so, that was, uh, so that's um, Colleen Cartwright uh, designed that form. And, uh, and it's, that form is the one that is endorsed by uh, the Board of Dying with, uh, Dying with Dignity New South Wales. And she's now CEO of Cartwright Consulting Australia. And I'd like everyone to welcome Professor Cartwright. lovely to be here with you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to the elders past and present. As previously Professor of Age Services, I also like to pay my respects to the elders of all the cultures that make up this wonderful country of Australia, including my own ancestors. I recently found a convict in the family tree. Yay! <laughs> you realise convicts are Australian royalty, don't you? And coming from Ireland, I thought, what did he do? Did he steal a loaf of bread to feed the starving children? Not in our family. <laughs> he was convicted of bigamy. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to talk about today is a whole range of issues. Now, with the hands that went up about advanced care planning, some of you, a lot of you, are going to know some of the things I'm going to talk about. Doesn't hurt to repeat them. But the context for this is that better living conditions and health care have led to increased longevity. There are now over 4,000 people in Australia, over 100, many of them still living well and happily at home, thank you very much. So this is a success story, no matter what the shock jocks might tell you. Um, an ageing population is not going to break the health budget. I often wonder what they would prefer, to go back to the turn of the 19th, 20th century, when average life expectancy was 50. Don't think so. Uh, two old ladies talking together, one said to the other one, I woke up this morning, and the other one said, that's a good start. <laughs> okay, so in addition to better living conditions and longevity, rapid technological development has allowed people who would previously have died to be kept alive for long periods of time, often through the use of things like feeding tubes and ventilators. But these very successes have led to practical legal and ethical issues, in particular around end-of-life care and extending the dying process, including for increasing numbers of people with dementia. You heard me say increasing numbers. The percentages per age group are not increasing, but because more people are living longer, the numbers are increasing. In the course of my research, I heard lots of stories that were cause for concern. This man told me that close to the end of his wife's life, because the cancer was attacking the bone and she had bad pain in her hip, they put a pin in and it was a terrible mess. It just added to her pain and they gave her more chemo as well and they took numerous x-rays, three and four a day. This is the last few days of this person's life. Is that any way for anyone to die? Well, quite clearly it isn't. Another woman told me about her husband, who still had capacity, and um, late 80s, lots of problems, she said, first of all, he was stubborn when he was in hospital. He wouldn't eat. He was just starving himself. They couldn't get him to eat, so they had to force feed him. They put a tube down his nose, and then they had to tie him in the bed because he kept pulling it out. He just didn't want it. 
if he just didn't want it, he just didn't have to have it, that is a case of criminal assault. I have the right to accept or refuse any treatment, even life-saving treatment, and if I say to a doctor or a nurse, don't touch me, and they do, even to save my life, I can have them for assault. Now, if his wife had known, she could have taken action. In a lot of studies my colleagues and I have done, we've asked a, a series of questions to, to a big, big population-based samples. Not, not all terminally ill people, some were, some weren't. Um, but we said, if you were terminally ill, what do you think would cause you the most distress? In every study we did, loss of mental faculties came in first. Now, if I've lost my mental faculties, it's probably bothering everybody around me more than me. But that's what people fear most. Every study we did, loss of control came in second. You saw Anne's video. You saw one of the things that was bothering her most was loss of control. Um, every study we did, death itself came in last. People were not afraid of dying. They were afraid of loss of mental faculties, control, independence, dignity, being a burden on families. These things were of much more concern to people than death itself. You can see that in the first study we had extreme pain and it came in at number three. Then the research team said, why have we got extreme pain on this list? If someone's in extreme pain, they should sue their doctor. There is no excuse for a terminally ill person to be left in pain. We can talk more about that. You know, every time I look at this slide, it reminds me of Woody Allen. Woody Allen said, I'm not afraid of dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> Well, I do want to be there, but I want it to be right. So uh, advanced care planning, for those of you who haven't done it, helps to address these fears and concerns. Now, the health and personal care mechanisms, as opposed to the financial mechanisms, you can appoint an enduring guardian. Now, get this term right, enduring guardian, not enduring power of attorney, to make your health care decisions in case of a future time of loss of capacity. You can write an advanced directive and if you don't, then there's a list of people who can make the decision for you. So let's look at Enduring Guardian. A competent person oh, over... Can you just back on that for one moment, please? Yeah. No, I can't, Jeff, yeah. because they've given me a really tight timeline. Yeah. Jeff, I'll give you the slide. Okay, thank you. All right. It's all right. I'm not going back. Um, <laughs> Um, the person you appoint has to be at least 18, usually a trusted relative or friend. Now, please make sure you appoint someone who is tough enough to stand up to the doctors, right? My sister died of acute onset leukaemia 10 days from diagnosis to death a few years ago. Um, being my sister, you won't be surprised that she had written her advance directive and that she had appointed her substitute decision maker, my niece, who took the position on the, um, uh, on the condition that I'd guide her along the way. On the last day when my sister had lost capacity, I'd been there with her most of the day, um, I went home, my niece phoned me, said, Aunty Col, I'm sure she's in pain and I just spoke to a nurse and she said we gave her something two hours ago. Oh. I said, you're not telling me they're still ordering pain relief for terminally ill patients four hourly. What century are they living in? And I said to my niece, are you up for a challenge? I've given her a few during the week. <laughs> she said, yep. I said, out to the desk, pretend you're me, say to the nurse, my mother's in pain and that's unacceptable. Please have something done about it. And I said, say it just like that. So she did. The nurse went, oh, okay. Turned to the man standing with his back to Anne-Marie and said, Dr X, could you please check Mrs Garcia? Her daughter said she's in pain. He went in, checked her, checked a file, up to morphine, up to midazolam and said to the nurses, she gets breakthrough medication every five minutes if she needs it. If she needs it. Nothing to do with euthanasia. Got that? Okay. Um, and if, so somebody who's tough enough, think about who you're going to appoint. Not just which one of the kids will get upset if I don't. Um, the person you appoint um, can't be your GP or the community nurse or someone the family's paying to come in and look after you. Um, and it can't be a relative of one of those either. Sometimes when I'm doing a presentation like this in, say, Western Queensland or far Western New South Wales, they say, well, that wipes out the community. Um, <laughs> however, at that point, I tell them to ring the tribunal. Okay. And you can appoint more than one. In New South Wales, if you appoint more than one, you need to state how they're to make their decisions, and down here you've only got the options of jointly or severally. So either one can do it or they can do it together. Whoever you appoint has to agree to the appointment, should understand your wishes, and be prepared to carry them out. 
and the, there's an, a specified form which has to be witnessed. Um, but if you want to appoint, as I've done, my son who lives in Sydney and my daughter who lives in Queensland, I can have their signatures witnessed separately. They don't have to be witnessed on the same day. Now let's look at an advanced directive. It's a legally, it's a written, legally binding document. Now I'm saying written, some oral advanced directives will hold, but protect yourself, write one. Um, and that allows a person to make their wishes for future health care known. It extends the current right of a competent person to refuse treatment to a future time when they may not be competent. It is not a form of euthanasia. It only allows actions which a person could legally consent to for themselves if they were competent to speak. And as with the enduring guardian provisions, it only comes into effect when the person who's making it has lost capacity to speak. Could I have some water, please, there? Um, has lost the capacity to make their own decisions. Now, all states and territories in Australia have statute law for advanced directives, except New South Wales and Tasmania. All of the others have specific parliamentary law, except New South Wales and Tasmania. And so for quite a while, doctors and solicitors in New South Wales were telling people they weren't legally binding. They already were legally binding under the common law, and the working party who developed the New South Wales processes um, said we don't need it because they're already binding under the common law. That was a mistake, because with the other states having the statute law and being able to have penalties for non-compliance and, and, and um, say which forms they want used and so forth. However, um, there hadn't been a common law case in Australia until 2009. The wonderful thing is that, um, sorry, uh, let me put it over here so I don't send it flying, which is something I could well do. Uh, that would be fine, thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so the wonderful thing is the first common law case in Australia happened in the Hunter New England area health region. A man went into Tari Hospital, lost capacity, um, was, went into kidney failure, was put on dialysis. Shortly thereafter, one of his friends arrived and said, I'm, I've been appointed his enduring guardian. We're both Jehovah's Witnesses. Not only does he not want a blood transfusion, he doesn't want, um, a, um, doesn't want dialysis. Um, and he'd written out a handwritten advance directive, which wasn't signed by anyone, not even him. Um, but he, the judge, the case went to the New South Wales Area Health Service, the Hunter New England Area Health Service, did a very smart thing. They didn't appeal against it or anything, they simply sent it straight to the Supreme Court, which I'd been praying for because this was our first common law case. Um, and the judge said um, that first he tested forensically the handwriting and then the enduring guardian said he was with the man and signed a stat deck when he wrote it. But it came down to you can write it on the back of an envelope and if there's evidence you've written it and no evidence you've changed your mind, it holds. We have since had two more cases in that same area. Oh, no, one in that area, one in Western Australia. Um, and the same result. They are legally binding. So don't let anyone tell you that they're not. Okay, now, I want to test you out. This is a study colleagues and I have done, um, people from UQ, QUT. We surveyed medical practitioners in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria in the seven specialties most closely linked to medical decisions at the end of life. This is a 55-year-old woman diagnosed with motor neurone disease six months ago, taken unconscious to hospital after a car accident. She's stable but still unconscious, so decisions are needed about her treatment. Her husband is listed as next of kin on previous hospital records. They've been separated for many years and don't see each other often. For the last five years, she's lived with her same-sex partner. The patient and her husband had two children, have two children, um, her son has enduring power of attorney for her. Her daughter has recently taken three months' leave to care for her mother full-time. All four of them are at her hospital bed. Who has the authority to make her decision? She hasn't written an advance directive and she hasn't appointed a substitute decision-maker. So who thinks it's the husband? Okay. Who thinks it's the son? Who thinks it's the daughter? Who thinks it's the same-sex partner? There's only about three of you in the room that got it right. Okay? I'll tell you why. In all three states, it's her partner. Um, and only 29% of respondents gave the correct answer. Um, and the lowest response was in New South Wales. <coughs> Remember I told you a few minutes ago 
that enduring power of attorney applies to money and property and does not let that person make decisions for health care, her son had enduring power of attorney. Didn't give him any authority to make her health care decisions. If she didn't have a partner, and I'll explain that in a minute, her daughter would have been next in line as non-professional carer. So let's look at what the legislation says. There is a specified order of authority in the legislation and it um, is called person responsible. It doesn't just mean somebody who's willing to take responsibility. It is specifically designated who is person responsible. Now it starts with a spouse, including de facto or same-sex partner, provided the relationship is close and continuing. So you see why the husband got ruled out? Haven't been together for five years. Not close and continuing. She has a partner for, with whom she's been in a close and continuing relationship for five years. Um, if you didn't have one, it moves to non-professional carer. Um, often that's a younger daughter or daughter-in-law, and you'll get these big strapping lads come in and say, oh, mum's next to kin, so I get to make her decisions. Sorry, Sonny, Jim, it's your sister that's been doing all the work and she gets to make the decisions because she's much more likely to know what your mother would want than you would. There was a case here in the New South Wales Tribunal where a woman had three children whom she hardly ever saw. She had a next-door neighbour who used to come in every morning and help her out of bed and put a washing on and take her to the doctor. When that woman lost capacity and the children started making decisions the neighbour knew she wouldn't want, the neighbour applied to the tribunal and she was deemed to be carer under the meaning of the Act, and she had authority to make that woman's decisions ahead of the three children. Now, if you want to, to know for certain who's going to make your decisions, it's really simple. Complete an enduring guardian form. It's not very long. You'll probably only do it once or at the most twice in your whole life. So get your act together, people. Um, and if you haven't had a carer, maybe you've just had a sudden heart attack or stroke, um, or been injured in the surf. These are not just for old people, by the way. Anyone can be injured in a car accident or sports field or whatever. Um, then it moves to close relative or friend, and at that point you could have half a dozen people having a Barney over the bed. Don't risk it. And the carer is not a staff member in a residential aged care facility. Now, when does a person have capacity to do these things? To make their own decisions, to write an advance directive, to appoint an enduring guardian? Well, the legislation throughout Australia is based on presumption of capacity. I don't have to prove to you that I'm competent. I'm competent unless you can prove I'm not. The onus of proof is not on me, it's on you. Now, um, and a diagnosis of dementia does not immediately mean that the person's lost capacity. It will depend on the level. Early dementia, they almost certainly will still have capacity. And even moderate, after a good night's sleep, they may still have. The person does need to understand the nature and the effect of the decisions, but it doesn't have to be in medical terms. Um, I had a document brought to me to witness in Queensland. I'm a JP there, and I took it from the lady and said, what do you think this uh, document's about, this sort of advanced directive? She said, oh, it's about what treatment I want or I don't want if I can't speak for myself in the future. Yep. And in here you've said, if you're in a persistent vegetative state, what do you think that means? Defined in the document. She said, oh, well, it means I'm unconscious and I'm breathing. I could got my eyes open, but I'll probably never really be conscious again. Close enough for the purpose of the, of the uh, argument. I said, you've said you don't want CPR if your heart stops. What, what, no, I've said, you've said if you're in a terminal condition, you don't want CPR. What does that mean? She said, well, it means if my heart stops, they're not going to push on it to make it go or give me a shock to make it go. I said, then what would happen? She said, well, then I'd die, but I'd rather die than be like that. She understood the nature and the effect of her decisions. She didn't need to tell me what a pathology was doing. The person also has to be able to communicate their decision in some way. I worked with someone in the spinal unit at PA Hospital who could only nod and shake his head. With assistance from his wife, his doctor and his nurse, we were able to complete his advance directive. He didn't want to go back on the ventilator. Um, he completed it and he died three weeks later and that was absolutely appropriate as well. And all he could do was nod and shake his head. Now, incapacity is not ignorance. If you haven't been given adequate information, it says nothing about your capacity. Um, eccentricity, cultural diversity, or having different ethical views, there's no evidence of incapacity. Communication failure. I have seen some woeful communication in healthcare situations. 
Having a diagnosis of dementia, as I said, is no evidence of incapacity. Hands up anyone in this room who has never made a bad decision. <laughs> Me too. I've made some doozies in my day. I don't think I lack capacity at the time, but looking back on some of them, I wouldn't put money on it. But making what someone else thinks is a bad decision is no evidence of incapacity. You can make your decisions for good reasons, bad reasons, or no reasons. And you don't even have to tell your doctor or your family or anyone else. Nice if you want to, bring them on side, but you don't have to. Um, and disagreeing with your doctor or nurse is no evidence of incapacity either. Sometimes I think that could be the opposite. <laughs> Actually, remember that slide I put up that showed what people are most concerned about at the end of life? Mm -hmm. Some people have a very clear idea of how it's going to be after they die. For example, a famous physician died and he went up to heaven. And when he got to the pearly gates, he smiled benignly at St Peter and he went to walk straight through. And St Peter said, oh, excuse me, and go to the back of the line, please. Oh, my good man, you obviously don't know who I am. St Peter said, it doesn't matter who you are, up here everyone's equal. Go to the back of the line, please. Oh, he was not impressed. He didn't think heaven was going to be like this. And then about half an hour later, a famous surgeon died and the same thing happened. He fronts up to St Peter, smiles and goes to walk straight through and St Peter said, excuse me, go to the back of the line, please. But, 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 but I invented the surgical procedure. It doesn't matter. Up here, everyone's equal. Go to the back of the line, please. So the pair of them are back there and they are not happy campers. They did not expect heaven to be like this. Especially when a few minutes later, they see this guy in a white coat, stethoscope round his neck, fronts up to St Peter, smiles, waves and goes straight through. Well, this is too much. So the pair of them go charging up to St Peter. They say, excuse us, you made us go to the back of the line, but you let him go straight through. St Peter said, I don't mind him. That's God. He just thinks he's a doctor. <laughs> Um, so, some of the problems we've just seen come from confusion about what is and what isn't euthanasia. Now, when you're arguing to get this legislation through, you need to be really clear about what is and what is not euthanasia, because there's a lot of confusion out there. And many problems about confusion lead to inadequate pain management, inappropriate use of medical technology, fear among health professionals about the legal consequences of care provision, it leads to poor doctor-patient communication and it leads to disillusioned patients, families and carers. Some commonly held beliefs are that euthanasia includes giving increasing amounts of needed pain relief, which may also have the effect of shortening the person's life, or respecting a patient's right to refuse further treatment, or withholding or withdrawing life support systems that have ceased to be effective or that will provide no real benefit to the patient. None of these is euthanasia and all are legally allowed now in Australia. The World Medical Association defines euthanasia as the deliberate ending of a person's life at his or her request using drugs to accelerate death. But studies my colleagues and I have done in Australia and Europe, we think what describes it best is that euthanasia is a deliberate act intended, most important word in the definition, intended to cause the death of the patient at that patient's request for what he or she sees as being in his or her best interest. So active, voluntary, <coughs> euthanasia in the original meaning of that word of a good or peaceful death. Now let's look at some of the things that are not. Giving pain relief, which may also shorten the patient's life, is often referred to as the doctrine of double effect, where the primary intention is to ease pain. A foreseen but unintended secondary consequence may be hastening death by a few hours or days. My palliative care friends tell me it normally doesn't, However, there's a lot of people out there looking after dying people who do not have palliative care training who won't give adequate pain relief because they think it is some form of euthanasia. But the doctrine of double effect is accepted by most religious and medical groups, including those who strongly oppose euthanasia. For example, the Catholic Church accepts the doctrine of double effect because the first person to use the term was St Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas said, if you must achieve a good end, in this case, relief of pain. And the only way you can achieve that good end is to also run the risk of a foreseen but unintended secondary consequence, i.e. hastening death by a few hours or days. You must still achieve the good end. There is no excuse for leaving a terminally ill person in pain. Bottom line, end of story. 
The only exception is if the person themselves says, okay, for you to control my pain means I'm going to be unconscious. I'm prepared to tolerate a certain level to stay conscious, to speak with my family, to interact. That, uh, just about the only exception I'd ever accept. But you know what the irony of all of this? Not giving adequate pain relief when it's needed can hasten death. You leave someone in severe pain, they can suffer respiratory distress and cramping, and you get these numbskulls who say, oh, you can't give them any more pain relief because we might hasten their death, so we leave them in agony and hasten their death. Not much going on in the top story, folks. Okay, now I have lots, I've got drawers full of cases about inadequate pain relief. This very frail elderly man fractured his hip, was admitted to a New South Wales hospital on a Friday night. He was considered too ill for surgery, too frail for surgery. He was clearly in agony. His daughter requested pain relief at a palliative care consultation. She was told there was no palliative care staff on the weekend. Rubbish. Somebody would have been on call. It was a large hospital, but as well, Palliative Care Australia said somebody would have been available at the end of a phone. So you got him, he's fractured, hip, no pain relief. Nurses came to roll him without additional pain medication. His screams drove his family from the hospital. On the third occasion, he looked at his daughter with terror in his eyes and he said, not roll, not roll. His daughter sat on the edge of the bed with her arms crossed and said to, threatened the nurses with physical violence if they touched him again. They didn't. That is barbaric. I've already told you that respecting a patient's right to refuse treatment is a legal and moral right possessed by every competent person under the common law in those states and territories that have a criminal code under the section relating to assault. It's also the right of someone who isn't competent now but who expressed their wishes in an advanced directive or through their substitute decision maker. Now withholding withdrawing futile life support systems or life support systems that will provide no real benefit to the patient, there's a big fight on over what futile means, um, that used to be called passive euthanasia. There's general agreement that that term is unhelpful. It can lead to the inappropriate continued use of invasive technology. And often it is not prolonging life. It is merely prolonging the dying process. So if I'm on my dying trajectory and you interrupt that process by putting in a ventilator or a feeding tube or a dialysis machine or some other form of technology, and after a time you realise you can't return me to any sort of quality of life, all you have done is put a roadblock in my dying. And if you remove that impediment to my dying that you put in in the first place, and allow my natural dying to continue keeping me comfortable in the process that has nothing whatsoever to do with euthanasia. Removal of futile treatment is good medical practice. Um, not clear definition in the law what that means, but it's generally agreed to be when burden outweighs benefit. But burden and benefit should only be from the point of view of the person whose life it is or from those closest to them if they can no longer say. Um, I did have a doctor say to me once, oh, I could keep them going for another week. Really? And would they thank you for that in their current condition? Now, I just want to quickly touch on this one um, because a lot of people mistakenly think that if people are not receiving food and fluid in the last few weeks that they are starving or dying of um, dehydration. They're not. Okay? Normal provision of food and fluid, if you offer someone something and they take it, they should be given what they will take but they should not have artificial nutrition or hydration. And if a dying person um, doesn't want to drink or eat, if they turn their head away, even if they have dementia, that should be taken as refusal. There's a lovely phrase they use in Europe, a lovely gentle phrase, which is putting down the spoon. When someone has reached the stage of their dying, where they're putting down the spoon, where they don't want to eat or drink anymore, now, families will often insist on people in that condition receiving artificial nutrition and hydration. If we could just get him to eat something, he'd get his strength back. No, he wouldn't, darling, he's dying. Uh, they need support, they need information, they need counselling. But it is not okay to harm the patient in order to soothe the family. Now, Finucane did a 30-year Medline search of all trials of peg feeding for people with dementia and found no evidence of positive outcomes. 
Now, PEG is where a tube is inserted directly into the stomach and all nutrition hydration is provided like that. Now, um, it didn't, the, the trial didn't show improved survival. It didn't prevent aspiration pneumonia. It didn't improve skin integrity. It didn't improve quality of life. But there was strong evidence of negative outcomes, including sight infection, aspiration pneumonia, weight gain, distress. So, and if you continue to artificially feed someone, you can cause all of those problems and scouring and all sorts of things. If you continue to artificially hydrate them, it can cause swelling and edema and they can drown in their own body fluids, unless you put a tube in the other end to take it back out again. Um, all of that's bad enough, but there's something worse. The human organism is designed to recognise when death is approaching and to release endorphins that act like a natural analgesic. Some of you will have seen people who are terminally restless and then at the very end they become calm and euphoric. That's because the body has released the endorphins. If you continue to artificially feed and hydrate them, the body doesn't get the signal and doesn't release the endorphins. So not only can you increase their suffering, you can deprive them of a peaceful death. Now a recent controversial addition to the debate is terminal sedation and its relationship to euthanasia. And this refers to the use of sedative drugs to induce unconsciousness in terminally ill patients in order to relieve suffering, including anxiety, when other attempts at relief have failed. And it includes withholding, withdrawing artificial nutrition hydration, as it should. Now, some doctors, such as Rodney Syme, have described terminal, terminal sedation as slow euthanasia. And Rodney says, well, if I give you this much medication over this much time, it's terminal sedation. If I give you this much medication over this much time, it's euthanasia. That debate is continuing, but for now, try not to stir that pot too much because it's currently legally available. And, some, and until we have euthanasia legislation, it is least, at least something that is available to assist suffering people. Now, some studies my colleagues and I did in Queensland and the Northern Territory, we asked, should a doctor or nurse give extra morphine if requested by terminally ill patients? More than 90% of health professionals and community members in all studies said yes for the doctor, 70% for the nurse. In Queensland, we said, should the law be changed to allow active voluntary euthanasia for terminally ill people who no longer wish to live? You'll note we didn't talk about t suffering or any of that. We simply said they were terminally ill and they don't want to live any longer. 43% um, of health professionals and 33% of GPs in two studies said yes. In both studies, 65% of the community said yes. In the Territory, because we did the research there while the Rights of the Terminally Ill Act was in place, we said, to what extent do you approve of the new legislation? 35% of the medical practitioners strongly approved or approved, 66% of the nurses and 75% of the community members strongly approved of the Territory legislation. But when we looked at written uh, qualitative data in that study, two doctors who strongly disapproved of the law, one said, I'm not opposed to euthanasia, but I don't think we should hand such a can of worms to lawyers and bureaucrats. Another one said, I've been helping my patients with this for years. We don't need a law about it. They were not saying they were opposed to euthanasia. They were saying they were opposed to the legislation. Two of the community members who strongly approved, um, one said, tell the Commonwealth to keep out of our business, and another one said, John Howard needs brain surgery. Um, they weren't talking about euthanasia at all. They were talking about states' rights. Because if that legislation had been passed in a state and not the territory, the Commonwealth could not have overturned it under the Constitution. Okay, so having got that information, in our next Queensland study, we asked the same question, should the law be changed? 36% of doctors, 52% of nurses, 51% of social workers and 61% of the community said yes. Then, drawing on what we found out in the Territory, we said, which of these four statements most closely matches your opinion? I'm against euthanasia and I don't want the law changed. I'm not against euthanasia, but I don't want the law changed. I'm in favour of euthanasia and I want the law changed. And the fourth group who hadn't made up their mind. So you look at this table and you'll see that if we add the second and third row, not anti-euthanasia, no change, together, I can tell you that doctors, nurses, social workers in the community, the majority of them are not opposed to euthanasia. But depending on where I add responses from column one and column two together, or column two or co and column three, I can either tell you that the majority of doctors are not opposed to euthanasia, or that the majority of doctors don't want the law changed. Statistics are interesting things, aren't they? Okay, 
Now, I'm just going to quickly finish up with a couple of slides about what really happened in the Northern Territory because there are learnings here for all of us at the moment. Kevin Andrews' Private Members Euthanasia Laws Act 1997 used the constitutional right of the Commonwealth Government to overturn the rights of the terminally ill act and prevent any other territory introducing similar legislation. The Commission of Inquiry called for submissions on that bill. Now churches through, firstly John Howard said we have to take nat national action to overturn that legislation. This is while he was Prime Minister. And churches throughout Australia asked parishioners to collect form letters from presbyteries and use that as the basis for submissions against euthanasia. Um, my brother told me he was he is still a practicing Catholic and he said the priest got up on the altar and told us all to come around to the presbytery and they'd give us these letters. Now they the letters, the form letters say don't post this form, use it as guide to write your own letter. Now Kevin Andrews took a team of people around the Northern Territory arguing against euthanasia. There was evidence of a great deal of misinformation and fear mongering in those meetings. One of my colleagues, a GP, attended one of the meetings and he was so appalled at the misinformation that was being spread that he stood up and tried to correct it and was ordered out of the meeting. That, those road trains set Aboriginal health back 10 years. Women stopped taking their babies to be immunised. Old people stopped going into hospital because they were afraid they would be euthanised. And given our treatment of Aboriginal people over the 200 years, you can't really be surprised that they might have thought that. Now, there were 12,578 written submissions, and the Commission said that 93% were in favour of overturning the legislation, which conflicts fairly strongly with our population surveys. I'm holding those 12,578 submissions. I just happened to be sent them after that Commission of Inquiry. Um, and I was asked recently if I could do a presentation at Charles Darwin University based on those submissions, so I had to do a pretty quick analysis. I looked at the first 6,474 of them. I did a detailed reading of the first 500, and I scanned the remainder for new issues or whether or not they were against euthanasia. Um, the majority were against um, euthanasia and in favour of overturning the legislation. But there was evidence of enormous confusion in the submissions about what the uh, Euthanasia Laws Bill was and even about the fact that euthanasia was already legal in the NT. Um, very strong evidence that people were provided with the wording. Um, the majority started with something like, I write to express my strong opposition to euthanasia or I am strongly opposed to the NT Act. There were hundreds of form letters Still with the instructions attached, don't post this form letter. <laughs> some were from churches, some were from the Euthanasia No campaign, and the wording was identical on each group of letters. Lots of references to God or being Christian. One man um, said that um, he went to visit his mother in the Northern Territory when this was all happening, and she handed him a letter and asked him would he um, post it for her, and she, he noticed it was addressed to the Commission. And he said, oh, what did you say, Mum? And she said, oh, I don't know, darling. The priest brought it, brought it round and asked me to um, sign it and post it. He didn't tell me, tell me to read it. <laughs> OK. So several submissions, including some on the form letters, referred to what the Nazis did. What the Nazis did was murder and genocide, not euthanasia. In the original Greek, that means a good or peaceful death. No matter what the Nazis called what they did, it was murder and genocide. Other false claims included that 60% of people in the, youth, in the Netherlands were euthanized without their permission, and that people over 70 put off going to hospital because they fear they won't come out. Absolute rubbish. I have done research in the Netherlands. I'm in constant um, contact with people over there. Um, the very oldest people in the Netherlands do not receive euthanasia because it wasn't part of their culture and they don't ask for it. Um, but that is absolute total rubbish. The other thing in the Netherlands I have to quickly say, um, you can request euthanasia in your advanced directive. You can say, when I reach this condition. Um, unfortunately, they're not being, for those people, they're not being honoured because the doctors over there have been so hammered about prudent practice. And the regulations for prudent practice say that it has to be a repeated request, a current repeated request. People are now understanding that their request in their advance directive won't be honoured, so they're requesting euthanasia before they lose capacity, which is really before they really want to go. Just something to consider. Okay, 
Um, and some submissions, I have to tell you, were both confused and amusing. If euthanasia is legalised, our anthem, Land of Hope and Glory, could never be sung again. <laughs> I didn't know that was our anthem. What about this one? Do not legalise abortion. Elderly people are frightened of falling ill. <laughs> I just love that one. Five minutes? Okay, should be right. Um, I was vaccinated with a gramophone needle at birth and I haven't stopped since, so okay. So, other fears expressed, many from misinformation. Like many other elderly people, I'm afraid that if euthanasia is legalised, I might be put to death at the whim of some do-gooder doctor. When I did this presentation in the Northern Territory, Judy Dent, who's the wife of Bob Dent, the first person to um, use the legislation up there, said in, in that um, presentation, she said, Colleen, in the Territory, you really, really, really had to want it in order to achieve it, because the, um, guide, the guidelines were so strict. Um, and many submissions claim that people who support euthanasia do so because they believe it means turning off life support machines. That isn't true. My, re my legis um, research can prove that. We spelt out very clearly what it was, and the majority of people said yes. Um, and they say opinion polls are misleading and people don't really understand what euthanasia is. Opinion polls generally ask the wrong question, but that's another um, presentation. Um, there were also fears about impact on quality of health care for old and disadvantaged people, that euthanasia is cheaper than good palliative care. And I have to tell you that the, palliative, the standard of palliative care in the Northern Territory went up dramatically after the passage of the Euthanasia Laws Act um, and that it's open to abuse. So, finally, see, I made it. Um, she gave me 45 minutes. <laughs> It had been reported to me that some voluntary euthanasia societies had taken up petitions in support of the Roti Act and of euthanasia itself, but that each petition was counted as one submission, no matter how many signatures it contained. I, up to 6,474 submissions, I hadn't actually found evidence of that. I had found letters from voluntary euthanasia societies, submissions, which generally said something like, we represent 2,000 members. It's still only going to be counted as one submission. Um, but in, then I thought, it kept niggling at me. I thought, I've got to look a bit further. So I did a really rapid zip through the rest of the submissions. And in one of the last three of the uh, 109 volumes, I found a submission from the Queensland Sunshine Coast Voluntary Euthanasia Society in support of euthanasia and the Roti Act and it included a petition with 2,485 signatures. That was counted as one submission in favour of euthanasia. Well, it was one submission. If you want to make a point, don't write petitions. Don't take up petitions, individual letters. Um, however, there was also a submission from a Chinese Presbyterian church with 228 form letters attached, a brief introduction in English, the main one in Chinese, but each letter was signed, so that was counted as 290, 229 submissions against euthanasia. So there's your lesson, folks. Thank you. We do have time for questions just before we uh, finish up and before I thank uh, Colleen. I, I, um, has anyone got any questions? Actually, I just wanted to ask you one. Um, with the, you know, if you, if you have 229 signatures on form letters, is there any value in doing that sort of thing? Or ultimately, is there any value in form letters? Or really, is it, does it come down to write individual letters? Because they um, I, I, The type letters are no problem. It doesn't have to be handwritten. Yeah. And in fact, if it's clearer when it's typed, that's even better. Um, it does have to be signed okay. in your handwriting. Um, form letters, I don't think, are necessarily such idea, although they certainly were accepted in that, um, in that Commission of Inquiry accepted them. Mm -hmm. You might have to check out whether a Commission of Inquiry on this current, the, the, you know, the, the um, call for submissions is out right now, and there's no New South Wales legislation. I have some problems with that legislation, as you know, um, the bill. But um, if you, um, yeah, so preferably put it in your own words, and as Sarah said, tell your story. Um, could, could I go back to the microphone? I've got a voice that shatters glass, so I usually think people can understand me, but sorry, darling. Yeah, so, um, okay. Um, yeah, form letters, um, as I said, in that 
in that commission of inquiry. They accepted them. Um, but if it's your, um, your story, then it's much more powerful. But start with, state your, your, your position. Don't go on for three quarters of a page and then say, so I am in favour of euthanasia. Start with, um, I strongly su uh, support uh, people's right to choose when they die and the current New South Wales legislation or whatever it is you want to say, but state your position up front. My reasons for so doing are, okay? Colleen, we've got another, another question. Sorry, I'm over here, Colleen. <laughs> here, here I am and uh, there's a hello. question over here. Thank you, Colleen, that was great. Um, interested if you have any comments on the New South Wales Trustee and Guardian or the Queensland Trustee and Guardian, uh, how strong they are, um, if you can summarise, as advocates for people, um, or whether they kind of wash their hands of it, or mm. yeah, other comments. I keep going to wander, don't I? Sorry. There's a light right in my eyes. Um, it depends. Some of them are good. Um, in Queensland, there's a few people have concerns about how slow the, the adult guardian people are. The tribunal is made up of some very good people. Um, the Victorian one particularly, which is, got, bodes well for the current situation. Um, I, the tribunal is always worth a try. It's interesting that the three common law cases in New South Wales went straight to the Supreme Court rather than the tribunal. Um, but um, yeah, sometimes it's a bit slow. Um, and um, the other area was um, uh, ambulance officers, um, you know, whether if someone comes racing out after they've started CPR, my mum wrote an advance directive to say she didn't want one. Um, but there are now in most of the states, the ambulance services, um, you can uh, complete a, um, get your GP to complete a form which says you're not to receive CPR. Um, so it, it varies, it really does vary, yeah. Okay, any further questions? Yes. Um, sorry, just like the mic. Thank you. Is there any way I can get a, um, a written copy of your address or the substance of it in short form? Um, Sarah, Sarah's going to be able to distribute the presentation that I just did. Good, thank you. Um, Other questions? If you're um, admitted to hospital and you're put on machine, your son's notified and he has enduring guardian, can he come and insist they take you off the machine? Absolutely. Absolutely. He can. So I, I was told that once they started... No. No. Um, I have the right to accept or refuse, including withdraw, withhold. Now, I have to tell you that I am currently advising a solicitor in New South Wales about a case that I am hoping will go to the court. Um, it looks like it's heading that way. It wasn't so much withdrawing withholding, but it was about a woman who had been caring for her mum uh, who had dementia for quite a long time. The geriatrician in the community said she was doing a splendid job. There were six children in the family, um, and uh, she had a younger brother, about number four down the list, who was a lawyer and who thought he should have the right to make all sorts of decisions. Um, the um, mother um, developed a, a pneumonia and was admitted to a public hospital here in Sydney. Um, and the geriatrician there was also doing a very good job. The doctor was very pleased. The doctor was doing what doctors are legally obliged to do and talk to the person responsible. The woman didn't have an advance directive and hadn't appointed an enduring guardian, but this woman was clearly person responsible, non-professional carer, remember the list? Um, but the brother decided she had to be transferred out of there into the private hospital and the geriatrician was saying, don't do that. They don't have the same equipment we have. Um, he was overridden. The, the daughter was ignored by the brother um, and the hospital and transferred to the private hospital, which was run by the brother's mate, who wouldn't even talk to this woman who had the legal authority and had the right to be told uh, everything that was going to happen and he said, make up your mind, she's going into a nursing home. And her daughter said, no, I've already arranged for 24-7 nursing care at home and rehabilitation in the community. He wouldn't even talk to her. She was transferred into the nursing home. Her daughter arrived on one occasion to find her sitting with wet hair in front of an open window, this woman with, with pneumonia. Um, 
and on a couple of weeks later when she went in, she found her mother sitting in a chair, non-responsive, with vomit down the front of her clothes and the staff just walking past her. The, the woman screamed and yelled and got an ambulance and got her back into the public hospital where she died. And a, an organisation which I won't mention right now because it will probably come up in the case, but who had some authority, was asked on what authority did, was the brother allowed to make the decisions and they said, oh, he was listed as next of kin on the hospital records. A next of kin has no legal authority with respect to substitute decision making and he wasn't next of kin anyway. In answer to your question, your enduring guardian has the same authority as you would have if you were competent to speak. If you are competent to speak, you can accept or refuse any treatment and insist that treatment be withdrawn. Yes. Um, normally what they Sorry, will do, the okay, repeat the question, will a hospital accept a note on your file saying not, do not resuscitate? If the hospital has spoken, staff have spoken to you while you are still competent, while you still have capacity, and they um, ask, and, and you've told them no, or if your enduring guardian comes in and says, now mum has, uh, you've lost capacity, mum has always said that if she was in this condition she wouldn't want to be resuscitated, they have to accept that. I was thinking, though, if you're admitted to an emergency and which your usual hospital have got, got uh, your files anyway... You know, you, you know what one of the problems is with the hospitals at the moment? Every admission, they're asking for a repeat of the do you want to be resuscitated or not um, order. Now, it's done. And if you have an advanced directive and you ask for that to be put into your file, they do not need to ask you on every admission and if it says in your advanced directive, I do not, if I'm in one of the following conditions, now you need to be careful what you list, but on the one that uh, you use here, if I'm in the terminal phase of a terminal illness, a persistent vegetative state, a permanent coma, or I'm so seriously ill or injured that my life can only be sustained through the continued application of a life sustaining measure. So I don't have to be terminally ill, but maybe I'm being sustained on dialysis or a ventilator or something, then I do or I don't want the following things. So if I'm on a life support machine and I've said if I, I can only be sustained through the continued use of that, then I don't want CPR. I don't want artificial nutrition or hydration or um, ventilation. I don't want antibiotics. Now on mine, against where it says I don't want antibiotics, I've written unless required as part of my palliative care. Because if I'm running a great fever and the only way they can make me comfortable before I die is to give me some antibiotics, okay, that's fine. Um, my, um, where it says other, I've written on mine, no test or operation is to be performed on me just to satisfy somebody's clinical curiosity, <laughs> only, only if it can provide direct benefit to me. Okay? And the person I've appointed as my substitute decision maker when I was doing my appointment, I phoned my son and I said, Steve, am I right in thinking you'd be happy to have my enduring power of attorney for health matters, uh, for finances, but you would prefer that Kimmy has my enduring guardianship for health care? He said, oh, absolutely, Mum, because she'll do as you tell her and I won't. <laughs> oh, great. And he said, no, I know you. You'd say if I'm in that condition, don't let them do any more tests or operations. But I'd want to bring every specialist that existed and keep you going to the last gasp. But Kim will do as you tell her. So I said to my daughter, is this okay by you? She said, of course it is, Mum, but isn't it typical? The boys get to look after the money and the girls get to do the caring. <laughs> but because you can appoint more than one and you can say how they're to make their decisions, um, if um, Kim's away and Steve has to make the decision, I've told him if he makes the wrong one, I'll come back and haunt him. <laughs> and I have to tell you, folks, my daughter's really a lot like me and I fear, it, I fear for any doctor who tells her she can't do what she's saying. One, one last question. No, we'll do two. We'll two. <laughs> I have a sister who's mentally ill and yes. I'm her guardian yes. in matters of health. Yes. She doesn't have the ability to make out a um, yeah, form. So what happens in her instance? Well, in her instance, if she's deemed not to have capacity, then you are the person with a decision-making authority. Yeah. And if you know quite well, because you've 
cared for her and, and you know what she would or wouldn't want. Um, but does she have times of lucidity? Are there times when she can tell you what she wants? No. Okay. Um, for any of you who might be working with someone who has a mental illness, but sometimes when they're well, they could record their wishes, that you can use the document um, a, a, for what is called a, um, um, a Ulysses agreement. Um, Ulysses, as you know, was lured onto the rocks by the siren song. So the next time he was going in that direction, he still wanted to hear the song, but he didn't want to have, have a smash up on the rocks. So he got his sailors to tie him to the mast and stop their ears up with wax so they couldn't hear him say, go that way. Um, so if, you, if someone has um, a mental illness and they have you know, times when they're, they're not having a florid moment, then they can say, I know that when I'm, having, when I'm not well, I make some stupid decisions and I authorise you, even if by force if necessary, to restrain me and treat me. Um, so that can happen, but otherwise, as in during Guardian, the decisions come back to you. The last one? My elderly mother, 91, is in advanced Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really have a carer because she's been in care mm. for seven years, or longer. Um, she's currently taking some food when presented, but am I correct in believing that we four sons can say to the nursing home, when she stops opening her mouth, stop feeding her and give her palliative care? Yes. Um, firstly, when you say she doesn't have a carer, she does. Who visits most often? Okay. Um, and who cared for her before she went into there? My late father. Okay. And so, um, in that order of authority, the non-professional carer sounds like it would be her sister. Yep. Have you got her on side? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So that's your first point. Um, it would be the person with legal authority as person responsible who could say, um, we know that she said she didn't want her dying to be prolonged. Never talk about prolonging their life, because you're not prolonging their life, you're prolonging their dying. Okay. Um, we understand we are not allowed to refuse normal provision of food and fluid, which you're not. If somebody puts the spoon there and the person takes it, so be it. But if she does start turning her head away or pushing the spoon away, that is refusal and they must accept, okay? And help everyone else around you to understand that she won't suffer hunger and she won't be suffering dehydration um, if she has entered her dying. Um, and advanced dementia, loss of the swallowing reflex is also a normal part of advanced dementia, so she might lose that anyway, okay? Okay, so that's hey. it. This one is uh, thank you so much. That is it's so incredibly stimulating and interesting. I can't believe it's been an hour. Because normally, our guest speakers only talk for about half an hour, 40 minutes. When I said to her, yeah. um, it's, it's about 50 minutes of my presentation, so she went, oh, no, nobody's going to stay awake that long. Yeah. <laughs> um, Pauline, Pauline, absolute diamond. And we are, um, you, you are being presented with what we give to our special contributors to Die With Dignity New South Wales. And this is Graham Anderson, who is a potter in Lightning Ridge. And, and actually created a kiln using Voluntary Euthanasia Society, which is what we used to be called newsletters. So it's a special, <laughs> it's a special burning and it was a special uh, number of pots for people who make a special contribution to our cause. So thank you very much, Colin. We really appreciate it. Sarah is going to put that on your, uh, on your website or send it to people. The, the, the video really will be on the website and yep. I will also transcribe the right. Of what but you if said. you have any questions at all, just get my email and email me and ask. You might be sorry to say no that. No way. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. And that brings our meeting to a close. Thanks, everyone. Here.